So you dismembered the body too? Yeah. Well, what did you do with the body parts? Somewhere? They're like, um, yeah. Basement, upstairs, yeah, downstairs? Absolutely in the basement. Up the ground, ground, and then, um, I know I forgot the head. I wanted the head. That's Taylor Shabiznes admitting to police that she choked Chad Theory on to death and then cut up his body. Did you want Chad to be dead? No. Her interview with police is just one damning piece of evidence in the Green Bay woman's murder trial. Welcome to Sidebar here on Law & Crime. I'm Anjanette Levy. A jury deliberated for just 45 minutes on Wednesday, no big shock there, before finding Taylor Shabiznes guilty of a gruesome crime, the first degree homicide of Shad Therion, her friend. The first verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, Taylor Denise Shabiznes, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count one of the information. Dated this date, July 26th, 2023, signed by the foreperson. The second verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, Taylor Denise Shabiznes, guilty of mutilating a corpse as charged in count two of the information. Dated this date, July 26, 2023, signed by the foreperson. Shabiznes was also found guilty of gross abuse of a corpse for dismembering Therion and third-degree sexual assault. Therion was her friend, but Shabiznes told police in a recorded statement that the two had used meth went back to his parents' house and started having sex. Then Shabiznes said she began to choke Theory on with a metal dog choker and she liked it. So she ended up killing him. The details are graphic and disturbing. It's hard to believe that someone who actually cared about another person could carry out this type of murder because it wasn't quick. It actually took some time. Shabiznes has pleaded not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, so this case really isn't about whether or not she committed the crime. It's pretty obvious she did, and that's why the jury deliberated for only 45 minutes. She essentially concedes that she killed him, but asserts she didn't know right from wrong at the time that she did so, so she shouldn't be sent to prison. Instead, her attorney believes she should be sent to a mental health facility. Joining me to discuss some of the damning evidence in the case against Taylor Shabiznes is Joseph Scott Morgan. He is a forensic death investigator, also the host of the Body Bags podcast. Joseph, welcome back to Sidebar. Thanks for coming on. You bet. Anytime. Good to see you, Jeanette. Good to see you. Uh, first question, have you ever had a case where a body was dismembered? Yes, I have. But please understand Though it seems as though that we have more and more, and it seems as though we actually do in the news as a practitioner, as a former death investigator in New Orleans and Atlanta, I can probably count on one hand uh, the number of dismemberment cases I had, uh, you know, either total dismemberment or partial dismemberment. So it seems as though the volume of these is picking up. I cover a lot of these on, on body bags, but this case involving ship business, uh, takes cake as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't remember anything in recent memory that was this horrific. I don't think people quite understand. And I've said this on the air many times because I've unfortunately had to cover cases where people who were murdered were dismembered. It takes a lot of work to dismember a body and yeah. to destroy or attempt to destroy a body. It is not easy. No, it's not. And there's several elements that play into this and, you know, things that are required in order to, oh, this sounds horrible, effectively pull this off. Uh, first off, you need a kind of a sequestered location where you can do this alone. Um, you need to have a certain level of knowledge, um, anatomical knowledge in particular. Um, and you have to show up with the right tools. And in most cases that we cover uh, on body bags in particular that are in the news, it seems as though people, it, it's almost like a flourish where they decide at the last moment that they're going to do this sort of thing and they grab whatever tools are, are handy. And of course, you know, that's, uh, you know, in the medical legal world, when we go into the morgue, there are dissections that we do. And we have the right tools. We have very sharp scalpels and saws and all those sorts of things. 
in a clinical setting, most of these people that engage in this behavior don't have access to those sorts of things. So you're, you're left with things like hand tools that you'll get out of the garage. But in the business uh, trial, you know, we're, they, they even mentioned, Anjanette, a pocket knife that was utilized. Uh, one of the detectives was on the stand. And, of course, kitchen knives as well. How gruesome. Okay, yeah. so let's take a look at some of the testimony that we've mm -hmm. heard in this case. This case, as you said, takes the cake. I, I think about it and I just can't even imagine talking about killing somebody who I described as my friend or best friend and, and doing it in this horrific fashion. So let's take a look at some of the testimony. Um, this is from the mother of Shad Therion and she testifies about finding her own son's head in a bucket. When you heard the door slam, did you hear any other noises? Not that I recall. Um, after you saw um, what was in the bucket, what did you do next? I went back up to the second floor of the house and woke up Steve to have him verify that I saw what I saw. And uh, what did Steve do? He got up and he went downstairs with me. And he, he looked in the bucket, but he could not verify that it, it was what I thought it was. Um, what did you and Steve do next? We went back upstairs um, to the second floor, because that's where our phones were plugged in and decided if we were calling 911 or the non-emergency number. Okay. And that's when we called. Uh, the uh, audio we heard earlier, was that the uh, call that was made to, uh, to law enforcement? Yes. That was you and Steve? Yes. Um, after that point, um, Did officers arrive? They did. Um, are you really able to approximate, you know, the time you hear the, the storm door slam to uh, the time Steve and yourself call 911 about how long that is? Not really. I don't, time wasn't moving the same as it normally does after you notice that. Joseph, you know, she didn't want to be on camera, understandably so. Um, so we are just looking at Taylor Shabusiness as Shad's mother is testifying. But there had been some other testimony that they had seen Taylor and Shad enter the home, um, you know, in the hours before she found her son's head in a bucket. So this is pretty damning evidence. We know she confessed, but still, she was down in the basement with Shad. Yeah, it is damning. And, you know, those time stamps revolving around videography are so very important. And, and it seems as though, uh, Anjanette, just about every case that we cover nowadays, you know, is going to involve some kind of electronic documentation, whether it be CCTV or phone, certainly pinging and that, that sort of thing. But yeah, you know, to, when you think about what we just heard and the face that's being put on this, you know, is you can't escape escape her gaze as it were she's almost breaking the fourth wall there and there's something you know underlying un underlyingly evil about this uh you know what that that mother experienced when she went down that staircase into the basement she's just looking for her son and she's triggered in her mind by thinking you know the sound of that maybe that's him coming home or whatever the case might be she's checking on him you know to go down to that downstairs bedroom and i, I had an a thought about this just a lot a little while ago and i think that a lot of the listeners can kind of identify with this do you ever have a moment in time where you're traveling down the road in your car or maybe you're out in your out in your your yard or wherever it is maybe you're at home and you catch a, gl a glimpse of something you say wait did i did i just see what i thought i saw and you have to take a second look and that goes to the verification process where she asked this gentleman to come down and verify 
probably he's experiencing the same moment in time. And then she makes that interesting statement where she says she's trying to decide if she wants to call 911 or the non-emergency number because, it, you know, it's, it's hard. You, you want confirmation, but you don't want confirmation, as it were, because it seems so very surreal. Notice how she stated that it seems like time slowed down. And I've had this actually occur with witnesses, uh, principals in cases that I've interviewed where they said that everything else just kind of melted away in that environment. How much more so when your brain, you know, you're trying to confirm this in your brain, is this my son's decapitated remain that's, that's sitting here in this bucket? It's really hard to get your brain to register that. But of course, you know, later on the police come out and they do in fact verify that. Most certainly. There was also evidence that police found, Green Bay police found this in Taylor's van. So let's take a look at that testimony. Um, we processed a vehicle that we had a warrant signed for. And uh, do you recall what, what sort of vehicle it was? Um, yep, it was a town and country minivan. Remember the color? Gold. And at that point, it had already been transferred uh, to uh, the Green Bay Police Department facility? Yes. And what was your role, I guess, in uh, processing the van? Um, I was doing photographs again, so I photographed the van itself and then um, items of interest, areas of interest. Okay. Uh, and what uh, are those exhibits? Uh, these are photographs of um, the back passenger driver side of the minivan, which includes a crock pot box um, and a body part inside the crock pot box, and then the crock pot box empty. Are those photographs that you took? Yes. Uh, and do those appear to fairly and accurately depict the van as you encountered it on February 23rd, 2022? Yes. Joseph, she's literally driving around with body parts in a van. Yeah. How, how do you, you know, how, I, I don't know how you make an excuse for that. If you're defense, how do you explain that away? Well, the most obvious thing is you're going to say that uh, they're not in quote unquote in their right mind for whatever reason, whether it's some kind of psychological pathology that's going on or whether it's drug induced or whatever. But the reality is this, uh, you have, photographic evidence of the fact that these elements were contained in a van that she had, uh, you know, ownership of, and that is her, her van. It's very hard to escape, you know, when, you know, you've got these biological tiebacks and compare that to what was found down in that basement. And there was that kind of, uh, there was that statement that, you know, kind of rings in my ears about, about this case is, she was <clears throat> being led away and you know it, it was apparently she stated that and i'm paraphrasing uh good luck finding everything you know just let that sink in just for a moment you know how callous you have to be uh, in order to say that about a fellow human being who you were involved let's face it in an intimate uh relationship with it, it's it it you know, it rises to a level of horror that not, that not many, even in my field, in my field, in medical legal death investigation, encounter very often. This is kind of an outlier. Most certainly. Let's now look at the testimony of the medical examiner who performed the autopsy on Shad Therion. Doctor, I believe you mentioned uh, essentially in the room the four main uh, containers where human remains were located. Is that consistent with your recollection? That is correct within that room, yes. Okay. So we've got the, the bucket, the blue bag on top of the dresser, the pink and gray bag on the floor, and then the tote. Are those the four locations where human remains were located in the room? That is correct. And can you just briefly describe the process that was used by the medical examiner's office to collect those remains? Of course, these containers that contained the human remains were photographed as they were or as they sat in, the, in their location. We then documented the external appearance of the containers. After that, um, a evidence sheet was placed out on the floor to try to collect any trace evidence that might be present either on the bag or within any of the bag's contents. I then opened each of the bags, 
removed the contents and laid them out on the evidence sheet for inspection. And can you uh, describe for the jury sort of big picture uh, on a scene like this, which is, I, I presume, unusual, um, what sorts of things you are looking for or attempting to uh, ascertain as you're walking through the room and finding remains in various locations? As I go through a room and evaluate the room, I'm looking for evidence of a disturbance, a struggle, or an altercation. I'm looking for signs of biological material which may tell me where a body part may be located. I'm also looking for evidence that may have contributed to the death. In other words, instruments, objects, weapons, um, evidence of drug paraphernalia. Um, in this case in particular, I'm also looking for places that a body may be concealed or that might be evidence of movement of a body from one location to another. Joseph, uh, so body parts, uh, he's examining yeah. the crime scene. Just another piece of damning evidence. And I think it shows intent yeah. here because she was found guilty of first degree intentional homicide. That is the title of the statute and the crime mm -hmm. in Wisconsin. So right. it's not like you didn't mean to do this. Yeah, this doesn't just happen by accident. Uh, you don't have... Uh, a body uh, with all of its elements separated from one another. But I, I got to pause here just for a second and give a tip of the cap to, to the medical examiner here on the stand. You're witnessing something that you don't commonly see. And we see on law and crime very frequently the um, testimony of forensic pathologists. And generally their testimony comes, arises from what they're seeing in the autopsy suite. Okay. This is one of those rare times where you actually have a medical examiner that attends the scene. And that's very important in this case. And, you know, he talked about laying out these, these cloths and this sort of thing. And, you know, the pathologist is uniquely qualified to, I'll, I'll, let me just put it bluntly, uh, to do an anatomical inventory. And that's really what you have to do. People, you know, would cringe at that, but that's, that's what you're faced with in this kind of work. And who better to have out there than somebody that is a skilled anatomist. And so, you know, you, you have these items that are in separate containers, you know, dispersed about the room. We're not even talking about what's in the, in the vehicle, but just what's there. So you can take account of what you're seeing. And it's very hard to make heads and tails. And remember what I said earlier about when we're in the morgue, we're actually doing things, if we're doing dissections, we're doing them in a very clinical, ordered matter, manner. Uh, you're talking about something that's very frenzied, okay, in this particular case. So when you can have someone like an expert like this physically at the scene and say, okay, this is what we're missing. You might be missing a digit off of an extremity or you might be missing an organ, which, you know, we do know in this particular case that this young man was literally eviscerated at the scene, organ by organ. Now, keep in mind from these uh, horrible kind of rudimentary incisions that she had made all about his body. So it's very important that we have the forensic pathologist there doing this work. I'm sure the police were very pleased to have them there because you can fall back, you can look and say, hey, doc, is there anything else that you can think of from a scientific perspective that we need to look for. And I also found it very compelling that he's looking for any kind of agent of injury that might be out there that could tie back to what happens. Let's look at some more testimony. This from Officer Tim Kenny of the Green Bay Police Department. And he talks about the evidence he found on Taylor Shabiznis herself. And uh, did you have uh, reason to assist uh, Officer Russell uh, with photographing um, some uh an individual on that day? Yes. Okay. And uh, where did, uh, did you respond to, to take these photographs? I was at the Green Bay Police Department and he took me to an interview room. Okay. And uh, did Officer Russell have, uh, have custody of an individual? Yes. Um, and did you uh, learn who that individual was? Yes. And who was that person? Taylor Shabiznis. Uh, do you see that person in court today? I do. Could you point out where she's sitting for us? She's sitting at the defendant's table. And then uh, what she's wearing? Uh, looks like a black cover with a black and blue blouse. Okay. Thank you. I'd ask the record to reflect the witness identified the defendant. It will still reflect. Um, and then what were you asked to do um, with respect to photographing Misha business? Uh, there were 
I guess cuts on her hands and blood on her clothing, which I was asked to photograph. And did you document, I guess, the, the exterior clothing areas? Yes. Those were photographs that you took? Yes, they were. Showing that's been marked with 82 or 86. I'll ask you to look through those. Yes. Uh, and what do you believe those to be? These would be the photographs that I took of her external clothing. So Joseph, she has blood on her clothing and cuts on her. Not unusual for somebody who's trying to dismember a body to cut themselves. No, no, it's not. Particularly with these kind of blunted, blunted uh, instruments that she's attempting to do to do this with. Uh, and in in my opinion at least based upon the injuries that the forensic pathologist documented, this is a very frenzied attack in Jeanette, where you've got these kind of randomized injuries all over the body. There's not really a, an organized uh, form and function here. It's very randomized. And so if, if we take that, that line of logic and apply it and say, well, she was in a frenzied state, well, the instrument that you're using, it's very easy to have it slip in your hand and cut your hand. And it, it doesn't necessarily, that it's not indicative of a defensive injury, you know, that we think about where people are blocking things to try to prevent from being stabbed. It's not okay. that type of thing. You can have these kind of little cuts. The, the big piece here, though, is the blood that's on there. If it is the victim's blood, this is the potential. Remember, if she's got blood on her hands, she does this, that's a transfer of blood. It's not like a dynamic spray that you might have, for instance, with high velocity blood spatter, those sorts of things. No, this is this is transfer or dripping, that sort of thing. That's probably what they're documenting. The next clip we are going to view is very odd. Uh, I don't know if it could get more strange with this case, but Taylor Shabiznis was actually caught searching for and posing with a photo of serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. And if uh, people don't know who he is, he is a serial killer from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who uh, targeted young boys and men and dismembered them and had body parts in his refrigerator. Let's take a look. When you were reviewing the phone itself, the extraction of the phone itself on March 2nd of 2022, did you note any searches related to Jeffrey Dahmer? Yes. Um, was there one? Was there more than one? How many? 24 total um, searches, such things like Jeffrey Dahmer, um, Jeff Boyardee, Jeffrey Dahmer's butt, Jeffrey Dahmer walking into court all sexy. Ms. Luberto, what is Exhibit 102? Uh, this is a celebrate extraction report of the screenshots taken by forensic analyst Danelski. So this is a report from the device itself, is that correct? Correct. And does 102 depict the photographs of uh, Dahmer that we had just discussed? Yes. Does it also contain photographs of Ms. Shabiznis? Yes. What is she doing in the photographs that are depicted in that report? She's got a cell phone next to her head. Um, there's a picture of Jeffrey Dahmer on the screen of the cell phone, and she's taking a selfie with it and smiling like they're taking a selfie together. And what is the date of that photograph? That was February 12th, 2022. So Joseph, this is 10, 11 days before she kills Shad Therion and dismembers his body. Jeffrey Dahmer looking all sexy and then, she, you know, internet searches and she's posing with a foot. I mean, if this case couldn't get any more ridiculous, this kind of is the cherry on top of the Sunday. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, uh, you know, this obsession uh, that many people have with serial killers, they don't understand the reality of what many of us have faced at seen that have worked, uh, worked in the wake of, of, of what they have done. I have friends that worked at at the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office during the height of what was going on with Jeffrey Dahmer, and it's absolutely horrific. And the fact that she took an image of herself superimposing herself into this world that uh, of Jeffrey Dahmer is chilling in and of itself. 
and what we can take away from that. And I guess perhaps what was intimate being intimated by this at least was the fact that, uh, you know, there's connection here. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, did, uh, in a postmortem state, uh, take apart bodies, you know, that there's all kinds of photographic evidence of this, uh, from these crime scenes. Uh, and we, we've read reports and we've seen autopsy reports and all these sorts of things over the years about what he did. And I guess in a broader sense, you would want to ask yourself if she's attached in this manner where she feels comfortable with this, this is something that she purposes to do. This wasn't an accident. Um, uh, was she on some kind of learning curve uh, using, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer uh, as, as maybe a roadmap for what she wanted to achieve? And finally, really, the, probably the most damning piece of evidence in this case, the words of Taylor Shabiznis herself. We hear in the news sometimes about people confessing falsely. That is not the case here. So let's listen to a little bit of the statement that she made to Green Bay Police Department detectives. And so where did you get the change? He pulled it out of his pocket. He pulled it out. Yeah, two of them walking me up around. Can, can you describe them to me? Chain. Chain link? Chain link and silver. Silver? Okay. And what size? Was it like a dog chain or a large block yeah. type of chain? You know no, like this big. Um, okay. you know, and then it has bowling. Mm -hmm. okay. So silver chains. Yes. And he had two of them. Yes. And what did you guys do with them? We put them around their necks. You did? Okay. And then what were you doing while they were around their necks? I strangled. I was strangling him. You were strangling him? So then after you realized he was no longer, he was dead, his face was purple, he said his mouth, blood's going out of his mouth, um, what'd you do? Mm -hmm. Clean him up a little bit. Yeah. And then, um, I, I just played with him like that. Yeah, you said play with them. What do you mean? Play with the stick. Okay. Yeah. Like I put them up over the um the bed, the bed, and then um stuff, stuff with it. Okay. Then you had them on the bed. What kind of bed? Was it an actual bed or just a mattress or what? So then you had sex with him? Yes. Okay. And I had a dildo and I took that. Okay. And I played with him too. What did you do with the dildo? And I just fell around and I held it down. What did you do with the dildo? I put it in his mouth, put it in his ass. Okay. Put it back. Okay, Joseph. So we have some pretty descriptive things there. Uh, she's just very matter of fact. I, I guess we should give her a little bit of credit for not trying to deny this. Uh, but her own words just paint this picture of somebody who did something, you know, choking her friends with this met her friend with this metal chain dog collar thing choker probably. And then he's dead and she's playing with his body parts. Yeah. Uh, you know, so now we've entered into the realm of necrophilia and uh, just when we thought that it couldn't get any darker, it does. Uh, and you know, what progresses from there is the stuff of nightmares, but it's important to understand what the detective said to her just then internet was the fact that, uh, he referenced back to say that this young man, Chad, his coloration had changed and that he had gone to purple. And we see this very commonly in cases of asphyxiation. Now, it can be either uh, suffocation, it can be oxygen deprivation, or it can actually be a ligature strangulation, a mechanical strangulation, uh, for instance, where we have this chain wrapped around the neck and there's more and more pressure tension applied to this. And, 
And this, this was key for the medical examiner, because remember what I said earlier, we had this particulate body that was all over the place. They're trying to put these pieces together. And so what's revealed here is the fact that even in death, and even when they examine this young man's head, it still had this kind of purple color. And I can tell you, if people at home want to know what it looks like, it's almost the same shade as an eggplant. Okay. It's that, that purple, it's livacious. Um, so what this means is that as oxygen is being deprived, the blood is being backed up in the head. It can't flow. There's no return back to the heart and the lungs and that sort of thing. So it's building up. There were even petechiae that were, that were noted by the medical examiner that gives you an indication of how much stress was being placed on his body when the life was literally being choked out of him with this choker, this chain. Uh, she used it to great effect in that sense. Um, and it still, his, his mortal remains still bore witness to actually what happened. And so the doctor couldn't find anything else. One, one other very important thing here. And I think that it's something that we need to all consider is that there was literally no blood left in his body. Now the average right. adult, the average adult male has about a gallon and a half of blood in their body. There was nothing left. They had to do toxicology based upon what they could draw up out of that bucket that his head and his genitalia were found in. It's absolutely horrifying. I can't believe his family has to sit and listen to this, oh. but as I said, at least she didn't try to deny it. She, right. she confessed. Right. We see what the, what the defense is here. She's claiming that you know, she's not guilty by mental, you know, disease or defect or what have you. I don't know if the jury's going to buy it, but we shall see because there it seems like there's were some deliberate actions here right. and she's trying to emulate potentially Jeffrey Dahmer. So, uh, Joseph Scott Morgan, thank you as always for your time. We appreciate it and hope you'll come back soon to talk with Anytime. us here on Sidebar. My pleasure. Thank you. That's it for this edition of Law & Crime Sidebar Podcast. You can listen to and download Sidebar on Apple, Spotify, Google, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, you can always watch it on Law & Crime's YouTube channel. I'm Anjanette Levy. We will see you next time.